Hi, everybody. Welcome to our final episode of AIN and In-Depth for the year. I am so happy to be with you, and I would like to welcome our guests first. Our guests today are Dr. Peter Landless and Dr. Torben Berglund, and as usual, my co-host, Sam Neves. Uh, Dr. Landless is the Director of Health Ministries for the Global Seventh Adventist Church, and Torben is uh, the Associate Director of Health Ministries for the Global Adventist Church, and we're so happy that you guys are here with us. Thank you. We started off in an we started off in an in depth in March with our health ministries team, and it actually sort of um, evolved or changed, and now we are ending the year back with our health ministries team because we think it's so important to talk about. Um, our health during the holidays and how to maintain health. But before we go, we have so much to talk about, but I really, really quickly want to address the topic that we've been getting the most questions on. And that is our um, people are wondering about the new COVID-19 vaccine that has just been starting, that has started to be administered this week. People are wondering if it's safe, um, if they should be able to take it. And there are a lot of rumors about it. So, Dr. Lanlis, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the vaccine and if you could help clear off maybe some of the misinformation that has been coming out in the news and through articles and on YouTube. Sure. Thank you for that question. It's a very, very important topic. And I think that one of the very important things we need to remember is that when we look at the change in longevity in living longer over the last hundred years, the majority of the progress which has been made in helping people live longer has not come through heart transplants, kidney transplants, chemotherapy. It's come through three major interventions, clean water, sanitation, and immunization. So we find that we have those three interventions which have made a huge difference. For example, you take uh, the smallpox when it started, people were so scared that if they were to take the smallpox immunization, they would develop a cow's head. There are cartoons. If you go back into history and, and look at the, the kind of concerns which people had, would they grow horns? Would they, you know, and you know, I, we, we smile at this and, and it was an amazing experience for me to go back and read those things because I sensed again that where we are in unfamiliar territory, fear is a major issue. And so I think we need to recognize that, you know, we can smile at some things, we can turn our noses up at some things, we can worry about other things but as far as immunization is concerned as a basic principle it is proven it is shown to make a difference smallpox has been eliminated polio is almost eradicated um, we see that where people are refusing for their children to be immunized we're seeing that rubella german measles is back up measles is back with us so the principle of immunization is a very sound one. The question about the COVID-19 vaccine. Well, there are many issues related to the fears that people have. It was predicted right from the beginning, it's going to take such a long time before a vaccine will be ready. And yes, looking at um, original techniques and conventional techniques in producing immunization, immunization and vaccines, uh, yeah, it would have taken a much longer time period. However, there is new biotechnology. When I say new, the technique of using messenger RNA is not new. It's been used in medicine for 15 years, but it's new in the production of a vaccine. In fact, there was a head start in technology because with the SARS vaccine, or the SARS outbreak in 2002, 2003, already research was moving in a direction to try and get to a point where a change could be brought in how we deal with uh, outbreaks like this. The other interesting point is that the actual genetics, the genome of the, of the uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus was actually 
discovered and uncovered within days of its being identified. So we're living in a totally different era of being able to identify the causal problem and then to work towards getting an, a vaccine to counter it. Now, fast forward to where we are now. Much to many people's surprise, but not to everybody's surprise. In fact, those who have been leading the charge on infectious diseases have been saying we probably, it's, it's optimistic to say we'd have a vaccine by December. Well, we have one by December, but it is not, it's, it's licensed purely under emergency um, conditions. So it's emergency conditions authorization, which have allowed it to be used and it's starting to be used. The United Kingdom's using it. And we know that in China and in Russia, uh, COVID-19 vaccines have been used for a while already. So with people's minds being set that this is gonna take a number of years before all the studies are done, before the safety is proven, and then it would be released, what is interesting using the mRNA techniques, um, they have been able to get this vaccine on track a lot more quickly. The other thing which is important to note, and we're talking particularly about the BioNTech, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, that the vaccines are relatively free. In fact, they are free of preservatives. That's why there needs to be the freezing process. There's still a lot of studying going on related to the outcomes, long-term safety. However, those who have been studying vaccines for a long time have shown that your major problems, if you're going to find major problems, side effects of a vaccine, those are going to manifest in the testing process within weeks to months of the use of that vaccine. So during the trial periods, the trial studies, and we saw there were some uh, issues related to the Oxford vaccine in the United Kingdom and led to the slowing of that, in fact, the withdrawal of it. Um, we've seen that in the implementation right now, there were two incidents of severe allergy when the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine was being used. Both of those had good outcomes. And it uh, actually, when one looks at the numbers of people who have any allergic reaction to the use of this uh, vaccine, both in the investigational form and now, it has a very low incidence of allergic responses. And that's probably because there's so little um, preservatives, in fact, no preservatives in the preparation. So there's been this fear which comes with it. Well, is it has it has it not been developed too quickly? Uh, and what is the mRNA? Is it going to change my genome? And you know, I think people are quite entitled to ask that question. It's a very important question. We're dealing with um, genetic biology. Well, actually, there's good news. The mRNA enters <clears throat> with a vaccine stimulating component enters into the fluid surrounding the nucleus of the cell. It does not go into the nucleus. Why is that important? Because the nucleus is where the genetic material is stored. So when the messenger RNA gets into the what's called the cytoplasm, the fluid around the nucleus, there it switches on the signal for the body to recognize the spike protein. You've all seen those pictures of the spike proteins around the coronavirus. Well, that's what it's, the body then uh, gets the signal, produce an antibody to the spike protein, and that's what it does. So when we look at side effects, we look at, do people get a fever from it? Yes, they do. Some people get a fever, some people get uh, body aches, um, and usually those symptoms resolve all of them, fever, body aches, odd pains within 72 hours. So the, the data is very encouraging. And when we look at uh, the kind of havoc that the coronavirus has wrought globally with the number of deaths, the amount of illness, the 
not only does it kill people, that's bad enough. In fact, that's terrible. But there are many people who have long-term sequelae or consequences of the coronavirus disease, of COVID-19. And they can go for months and we're not in it long enough, maybe years, with symptoms related to the condition. That's not talking about those who have permanent heart damage, strokes, other damage to arteries and so on. From this condition, which is, uh, our knowledge is, is only beginning to grow about it. It is, a, it is a virus which causes very significant changes. So in summary, just a few points. Number one, has it been tested? It is being tested. Have the testing periods been the same amount of time that we see with other vaccines? No, that's why it's under emergency release authorization at the moment. Have there been significant side effects which should say to us, don't touch this vaccine? No. Is it effective? Well, between 92 and 95% efficiency. 50% with the first injection, up to 95% with the second one. So you need to have two injections for it. But we're looking at a very significant e efficacy or efficiency of the vaccine. So and there are many unanswered questions. And once you've had it, does it mean that you'll never need to have it again? We don't know yet. That will be learned as we go. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And it would appear that this is going to be very helpful in our total onslaught against the COVID-19 pandemic, which we face. There are many things that we could talk about, but already I've spoken for probably too long on just that one issue, but it is so important. And I think that people yeah. should not be ridiculed for having questions. They should not be um, uh, looked down upon because of, uh, as being faithless or being overly concerned. We all have questions, but I must tell you from looking at the science speaking with scientists who have been involved in the development of the vaccine and the release of the vaccine. I'm at peace that when it's offered to me, I will be happy to take it. But that's my persuasion. Yeah, I, I'm more upset that it's two vaccines, two, two shots than, than anything. I do, I, I, and I, I do think you're right. You've done such a great job of explaining it. So I only want to say a couple more things. And the first is, um, there we the church does have a statement on immunizations that people can find on Adventist.org um, if they want further reading, um, which is here. Um, Brent put it up. Thank you so much. And then the second thing is the Health Ministries website of the Global Adventist Church. You have a lot of resources that people, if they have questions, if they're wondering what, um, how to be safe and that type of thing, that they can go to the, the, to the website of the Health Ministries Department, and Brent's putting it up here right now, and wow. you have a lot of resources, and I'm sure that as more information is being developed, and if the church has more to say about it, that, the, that they can find it here and on the church's other communication websites. Um, that we will make sure that we're communicating with our our global Adventist church. But here is um, a lot of what you have. Um, so we can talk about um, other things besides the vaccine, but I think it's important to address some of the questions that people have regarding this new vaccine. Sure. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sam. Do, were you about to say something? Dr. Landless, you're very generous. In, in how you address some of the concerns that people have. There is, there is an undercurrent of conspiracy theories on YouTube. And they this vaccine is like gold for them because it's easy to get clicks and to get people to watch if you put a extravagant title and it doesn't really matter on YouTube whether you can substantiate whatever crazy claim you're making. And people do that for clicks, but my question is is really to to uh, to Dr. Torben. Watching these videos that are unsubstant, uh, there there is no science behind these fears, as far as we can tell. What does that do to someone's mental health? 
Uh, and what are the results of of watching many hours of these crazy theories? Well, I think that's a very important question in the time we're living in, because there's so much information out there uh, that we are being sort of bombarded with. It's so easily to access, and it looks so convincing. If you go to some of these videos, it looks like there's some of these big uh, media outlets that are making it. It's so professional, so convincing. And there is a, usually there is a, some kind of logic in what they are saying. They're making some sort of basic assumptions and then they build on that. And then in the end, it sounds very convincing. But I think it's important is now more than ever that people are very careful in what they feed their minds with, what kind of information we open ourselves up to. Because if we sit on YouTube, like any one of us who would, if we would sit on YouTube and watch all these all day, day in, day out, in the end, it will start to impact probably sooner rather than later how we think. Because we are not as smart as we often want to think, think we are. It's very difficult for us to to sort out what's good and what's bad what we should listen to and what we should not some i hear some people say well i like to stay informed i want to listen to both sides uh, but well there's no value in listening to think things that basically are junk that because that's a lot of that what's out there is basically junk um, and sort of there's this saying junk in junk out and that's what happens that is sort of the hard, brutal reality of what happens. If you feed your mind with this, in the end, you will believe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you are a top scientist, you know all the research you can do, then maybe you can expose yourself to some of this and be able to, to stay sort of with keep things in perspective. But if you don't have that background, then make sure that whatever you feed your mind with, whatever you feed your thinking with is reliable from reliable sources that is serious. And there's so much out there that I think now people are binging on basically because people are afraid, people are worried, they want to have answers, they want to figure out what's going on. That's very natural, like we've been in this for months now. We're wondering what's going on, when is this going to end, what is the future like? And in this sort of climate, this environment, uh, people have all kinds of ideas and, and thoughts about it. And uh, definitely not all of it is good. Much of it is not worth paying any attention to. Uh, it's better not to spend time on it, better not to discuss it, not to be on the uh, internet, like discussion forums, arguing back and forth and be getting enemies and saying all kinds of bad things there. Sort of feed your mind with what is good hold on to that that's yeah. a good basic biblical principle uh, that i think is worth a lot in these times uh, that we're living in now and that includes adventists also we need as adventists to be careful what we feed our minds with excellent thank you that's such good advice all around put into your mind i mean that's as you said good biblical advice put in your mind what is good because i have noticed um and this is just sort of a, a side that um, I've seen so many people, especially recently in the past few years, uh, who have not been into conspiracy theorists, theories as such, but um, the increasing of their YouTube watching means the increasing of their conspiracy theory <laughs> believing. And so you're right, you do have to be careful what you're watching, because I think it's, there's something in it that plays to our base fears, you know, that they feed on things that we might already be afraid of a little bit and um they exploit that so and also really polarization right. polarization i think that that this holiday will be a very special one especially in america I, I would say in america in particular because there will be a lot of families that are coming together that fundamentally disagree with politically and mainly politically and i want to talk about that in terms of of how do you sit across from a Christmas table or a any meal for that matter with people that you see once or twice a year and you, you've been told by the YouTube and social media consumption that they are the them, they are the enemy, they are the ones that are, that are against all that is good and noble. 
but they think the same about you. And now you're not us and them. They are your family. Everybody is us. How do you handle that? And what are the implications to this? Um, this is not just in the United States. We have this in different parts of the world. We've never been so polarized, maybe because of the algorithms, maybe because of our fears. I don't know exactly why, uh, but how do you handle the holidays in a healthy way in this in this, um, in this this environment? Any of you, please, Dr. Landless or Dr. Torben. <laughs> well, I'm... I just just easy you. question. Just easy <laughs> question. Socially questions here. distancing is the answer. <laughs> Social, socially distant from the people you disagree with. Well, <laughs> see that that is the very easy answer. The easy answer is that you don't have anybody around to eat at Christmas Day. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it saves you it saves you the issue. You're not exposed to COVID. It costs you less. You don't have to get dressed. No, I'm just joking. But but I'm not I'm not entirely joking. I think one of the things that is important is that people who uh, are taking chances and are still having big family gatherings are not only at risk for the fractures that come related to exactly what you've talked about, the polarization, but they're at risk of spreading it to each other. And in fact, I, I, we don't have time to tell you the stories about people who we know uh, within our circles who have been through this. And, 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 and then there's this kind of surprised heartache when they say, but you know, so-and-so died. Again, we should not be pointing fingers, but we need to listen. So keeping the, the meeting, the, the gathering small over the Christmas and New Year, Thanksgiving, it's gone. I mean, we see, we see the following here in the United States. Two, two weeks following Thanksgiving, the surge was in its peak. So the polarization is a huge issue. The stress related to it is a huge issue, and I'll defer to Torben on that, but there's one of the very important physiological issues that's related to stress. If you're continually under stress, and what um, Jennifer was describing of, and, and Torben's been describing of feeding your mind all the time with things that stress you all the time, you really, when you're looking at these things, you don't leave there feeling, oh, that was not really, now I'm really relaxed having read all these conspiracies or listened to stories which are not true. You are running on high revs. And while you do that, hormones like cortisol, other hormones are running high. Uh, it, it's been shown that stress decreases your natural killer cells, in other words, your lymphocytes. So your actual ability to face uh, immune challenges decreases mm. through stress. So we're in a self-defeating de de mode by continually just imbibing and immersing ourselves in what my very respected colleague calls junk. And uh, as opposed to thinking on those things if there be any virtue, if there be any value, if there be any good, think on those things. So mm -hmm. it actually, there's a, there's a well, there are well-known mechanisms underlying um, breaking down our immune system when we have this ongoing stress. So absolutely, we need to be careful what we read, what we listen to. I'm reading a book right now, which I would recommend people to read. It's called The Doctor Who Fooled the World. And it's about Andrew Wakefield, and it's written by a man called Deer. And he exposes the story, uh, Andrew Wakefield, who was the first one to link autism to vaccination, to rubella immunization. His paper was shown to be fraudulent 10 years later. It was, um, he was discredited as a physician. He came to the United States from the United Kingdom and continued to spread the story. A lot of the anti-vaxxing momentum arose from the work of Andrew Wakefield. But when you see the way this has percolated and filtered through our societies, in a way that people have these huge fears. That's why I was being a little generous, Sam. Yeah, not, I because, uh, I, not, not because I want to not call nonsense by its right name. Mm. I'm more than happy to do that. And what troubles me the most is not only, you know, people, I don't know how many of, you, of us sitting on this group of four have seen 
infantile paralysis or, or polio. No. In the real. No. Where, where people are deformed, where they can't walk, where they struggle in braces. And that's preventable. That's preventable. People shouldn't die from measles. People shouldn't die from meningococcal meningitis. We have ways of preventing that. And yet, there are people who would continue to say, don't take it. Don't have the immunization. We're not talking COVID-19 now. We're talking other things. If you've seen a baby that's born with congenital rubella, congenital German measles, cataracts, microcephaly, small head, small brain, mental retardation, deafness. Really? That's preventable. And so, you know, there is a need to understand that we need to have correct information, look at what is valued, what is accurate, what is evidence-based, and follow that. And also, when it comes to conspiracy theories that look at the distortion of biblical doctrines and interpretation, those are even more dangerous because people are, are prone to tailor make their conspiracy theory and mm -hmm. try and say, well, here you have it. It's biblical. Yeah. yeah. And one last thing I want to add to this, that people who say that the Seventh-day Adventist church, for example, is not in favor of immunization. One of our co-founders, Ellen White, was alive and working during the time of one of the peaks of the smallpox epidemic. And the smallpox vaccine was, was new. She took it. She encouraged those closest to her to take it. Not only because she knew and realized that people who were immunized had a lesser um, degree of the disease if they got it. Many of them were, would be immune, but also to protect others. And here's a very important principle when we're looking at being healthy over the holidays. You know, we are so introspective. We are sometimes very, we, we navel gazers. We, we think, what, 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 what about me? I'm the one. How's it going to affect me? Well, let's think of how it affects other people too. And if I'm not going to be careful wearing a mask, socially distancing, doing the things I should, I'm putting them at risk. I'm putting other people at risk. I'm putting you at risk. Mm. So those are things we need to realize. So we have a tradition, not only of a health message, but of being responsible in the communities in which we live. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Torben, taking Dr. Landless's um, point that we should be socially distanced um, during the holidays, but Sam's question that I'm going to do this in the modern day sense, we're all Zooming probably with people um, whom we may share different opinions with, who are our family members, um, who we may disagree with during this holiday season. And, and Zoom is the way that we're connecting with one another. It seems it's um, this time of year. Uh, on Friday is my mom's birthday and we are having to Zoom with my sister and her kids because I quarantined for two weeks. So I was able to spend this time with my parents but my sister is a teacher and she's not able to so um so we're zooming and families around the the planet are doing this and they disagree like sam says we're polarized um we have a in our whole external family a no talking about politics role we just don't even bring it up um Why is it's, just, it's just no point nobody's changing anyone's mind so we don't talk about it in our family um, but what are some of the ways that we can sort of look past? I think that sometimes when we when we sit around the dinner table, we forget these people are a family, and we are in a polarized um, society right now. And family, friends, uh, church family, how do we look across the table or the Zoom conference or the Zoom camera, and we we treat each other with respect and love? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a very valid question <laughs> that many may be facing in, in the com coming days. Uh, I think what we talked about, the, the stress that we're under, uh, Dr. Landers talked about the 
heightened cortisol. Um, like we are, many of us, whether we realize it or not, in this stress situation, uh, we are hyper alert to danger. Uh, and we are sort of sensitive where where is the danger lurking so we had the COVID-19 we had politics this year uh, we have we talked about all these conspiracy theories like all this we're looking for danger and we are likely to find it in one another as well like that the enemy is on the other side of the table or that's where the that's where I, I'll attack the problem and everything that's dangerous uh, and troubling me in the world in, in the other person on, on the other side of the table uh, or on the other side of the Zoom call or however we, we connect. I think we just have to realize that in this situation that we're in, the, we, it's just not a good time to deal with those issues. Sort of, we, many of us, we, we are too stressed. We've been, we may be fragile after months and months with this, this, this pandemic. Uh, we are just not in a good place. To, to deal maturely with, with these things. So I think sort of good advice is just, just don't go there. Uh, and maybe again, back to what we talked about earlier, like focus on the good things, focus on what unites, focus on what builds, because there's plenty of things of those things also. And if we're even going to bridge these gaps of polarization, we have to have the understanding that the, the other people that we're talking to, they are reasonable people also. They are also kind people. They are people that we, we have much more in common with uh, than, than we have differences with in, in, in general. So I think just like this, have a, a ceasefire. I think this, this this Christmas, this holiday, and maybe for some months into the next year, until we all are in a better place, um, and then sort of, then maybe it's time when we are able to do it calm, reasonably, be where we when we are able to be uh, open to listen, to try to understand one another. Then okay, let's let's try it then. Mm -hmm. But but many of us will not be in that place. At, at the moment, we are just too stressed. We are too worried. Uh, there's just been too many things going on uh, and sort of probably best to just push the pause button and say, okay, we'll we'll get back to this sometime into the future. Yeah. So everybody adopt my family's don't talk about it rule <laughs> <laughs> for the holidays this year. Let, let me don't. ask the opposite question, if I may. Christmas is, is a time that a lot of people stress about being alone because everybody's like with normally, you know, everybody has a family to go to. Uh, but there are millions of people that spend the holidays alone in a normal case. I mean, not not related to COVID. Maybe they're far away in university. They can't go home for whatever reason. Maybe they are elderly and the children live far away for whatever reason that are. Um, millions of people that normally spend the holidays alone. With COVID, that number can only increase. Are there any healthy ways or, or any practical advice that you gentlemen would like to, to bring? And Jennifer, if you have any of those as well, to people that may spend Christmas alone, away from family, away from loved ones, or maybe they don't even have any loved ones anymore. What can they do to to be healthy in the holidays and to experience some joy at least. I, I don't know, any insights on that, please? I'd like to just, you, know, you go ahead, Torben. Okay, well, I, I think the, the ones who are missing someone to be together with are, I would say, in the better place than the ones who are just alone and don't have anyone to be with. Uh, that you actually are missing someone means that there are some people in your life who are very valuable. And even though that hurts to be away from them, that hurt is an indication that you actually have something. And then sort of you have to think like, well, what do I do with that? How do I sort of uh, deal with this pain in this season that we're in now when we cannot be together? We are missing out on something that would be good. But just that we feel that we're missing out on something means that, well, we actually have something good. There is a bond. There is something good that, that, that we have. So I think that's how we think about it may, may to some extent be, be something that can help us cope with it. And then sort of use whatever opportunities we have uh, to connect 
uh, with them. And also, I would say, another thing, whenever we're struggling, when we're suffering ourselves, sometimes if we can reach out and help someone else, uh, so we don't get sort of just absorbed in our own pain and misery. Uh, but actually, when we reach out to someone, when we can relieve someone else's pain and suffering, that 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 actually is a win-win situation for for us. So, like helping others by or helping ourselves by helping others uh, is a principle that 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 can be worth considering. And applying also in this situation. Um, Dr. Landless, you were gonna, that's a good point, actually. Uh, not actually, obviously. <laughs> no, I, I very much appreciate the, the, the whole, the profundity of the concept that if you are missing someone, you at least have someone or something that you are missing. Uh, how many people just are totally, totally alone without even that privilege? I just wanted to share just the other day, there was a, a message uh, sent to me by my assistant, which said, uh, this, somebody wants you to call them back. They have questions about the vaccine and they worried about taking it. And um, I could see this is from a, um, uh, uh, the message came from someone who was in a frail care, uh, assisted living uh, mm. venue. And, um, I just wondered, you know, as not uncommonly, some of these conversations can be quite delicate because people want to hear certain things or they can be quite aggressive in approaching the, the vaccine stance. But I, I just thought, you know, I'm going to call right away. The message came through within a few minutes. I called, you know, a beautiful dear lady on the other side of the phone who was just so thrilled. Thank you for calling me back. And she had, she'd read an article that we had written sometime in the last year and just wanted to check that against her concerns on the vaccine that had been offered to her. So it was after the vaccine was now authorized. And um, I, just, I just sensed and realized how thrilled she was to have a phone call. Mm -hmm. This made a difference in her life. I don't know her from anywhere. But I just felt blessed by the conversation. Torben was saying, by helping you are helped. I left that phone call. There was no acrimony. There was no upset. There, and I was able to even, I said, would you mind if I prayed with you? She said, I'd love that. And as I was about to go, she said, I'd like to pray for you. <laughs> and there, this, this, this lady, 84 years old, very cogent, blessed my life. Why am I sharing this? I left that conversation thinking to myself, this whole term of social distancing is junk. The term. We should be physically distanced, but not socially distanced. Yeah. You get the difference? Yeah. So, 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 so get where I'm going to, I'm, I'm saying here, make the phone call, write the note, talk to people who Nobody else will talk to if you can. You know, we again, I am self-absorbed. I've loved Christmas since I was a little kid. And you know, it's it's not all about me. It's about what can I do for others? How can I make a difference? And I really, I really just wanted to share that because it moved me at the difference it makes to us. We want to be healthy, sure. We want to be. Physically distant, we don't want to be. We need to be physically distanced, so we should. But don't disconnect. Mm -hmm. Don't not reach out. Make sure that we are. And I think we should be very wise what we talk about. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about things which you know are going to be uh, touchstones in causing a problem. But be physically distanced, but very socially connected. It's important. Our lives depend on it. Yeah, I was actually um, listening to my parents on the phone recently, and they were talking to a relative, and they were talking about how lonely um, they had been without the without my sister and I around, without their grandkids around. You know, we I think all of us have especially tried 
to protect the seniors in our life or the people who are a little bit older, our grandparents, because we've heard that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that it impacts elderly people more so than maybe younger people. So everybody's been trying so hard to protect those who are older that they've almost been alienated. And they were talking about how lonely they've been and how lonely their friends have been because nobody goes around them anymore. And sometimes that, because we're not going around them anymore, you know, you forget to call and, or you forget to text and you, your life becomes so busy. And how important it is to remember, like you said, to reach out and not socially distance, but physically distance from people because, um, yeah, we have a lot of people who are incredibly lonely, lonely and they would say, especially the maybe seniors right now who are, who are feeling a little bit more alienated than the rest of the population um, at this time. I want to um, talk a little bit about the holidays, Dr. Landless, apart from COVID. And on ANN, we have done this in the past. You have made fruitcake on my program uh, before with uh, the former director, Alan Handyside. But I do want to talk about um, the holidays outside of the pandemic, because this is a time of year where we should be talking about health anyway. We sort of forget about it. We forget that we shouldn't have all the cookies and the candy and the food. And we are off work and we don't exercise. We sort of sit by the fire and drink hot chocolate and eat cookies and spend time with our family. Um, so I went, <laughs> sounds great, right? I, I don't know what you're talking about. What is it, what, what fantasy world do you live in? We're going to be out there exercising every morning, having yeah. salad for lunch, eating nothing for supper. It's going to be a time of Spartan behavior, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Now, um, so I would like to talk about this a little bit about tips we, maybe we should be keeping in mind um, during the holidays and. Um, how we should be looking after our physical and mental health, even if there was no pandemic, this is something we should be talking about anyway. Because for some, like um, Sam mentioned, it's a lonely time of year. The other thing is we gear ourselves up, this is for New Year's, we gear ourselves up and we make resolutions that we immediately break. So I would like to have, I would like to pretend there is no pandemic for the next couple of minutes and talk about health. Um, during the holidays, like we're not having any pandemic related conversation at all. Um, is that possible? It is possible. And we should, <laughs> we should continue with all the healthy habits. You don't boost immunity. You maintain a healthy immune system by living healthfully all the time. And I think this is something which is really crucial is that do we celebrate? Absolutely, we celebrate. Do we feast sometimes? Yes, we do. Um, but one of the very important things is to have a regular routine to continue eating healthy foods, to continue looking after the health God has loaned and entrusted to us. And the fact that it's holidays, I think, um, you said you're not working. I don't know who you work for and with but you're lucky you're not working because I'll still be working but having said that we do need to have breaks we need to de-stress we need to sleep we need to do those good things but we should not just become couch potatoes we should continue to move we think to ourselves well one or two extra cookies make no difference we'll get that all not so easy doesn't mean we shouldn't have any cookies or have any 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 so-called special treats no not at all i don't believe that's the way we should be having said that though i think that we should continue the importance of healthy sleeping routines exercise routines eating regularly eating healthy foods uh, watching stress and and i i think torben can help us a lot with those things particularly our mental health is affected very significantly by our physical health and behaviors isn't that right torben well, absolutely. I think uh, what we do physically impacts our lifestyle, impacts our mental well-being as much as our physical well well-being. So I think that given given the year that we have behind us, um, also I think many of us we really need a timeout. We need a break. 
uh, from everything that has been been going on and that i would think maybe that should include maybe a break from media and from media consumption uh, also to take like maybe make these holidays sort of a sabbatical uh, from our devices from our screens uh, taking some time off rediscovering that there is actually a life apart from what's going on in those 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 screens uh, like that that will I think will be very helpful and beneficial to us if you use screens if you watch something like again prioritize things that are good things that are uplifting if you have a Netflix account there's tons of things that you can watch there pick the ones things that are good so don't don't just uh, go with whatever comes up as a recommendation. Pick good things. Like I think that's as a principle. As we live, like the more we fill our lives with good things, the less space there will be for what's bad. Uh, also, if you make sure that you eat uh, good meals, then sort of in a way those cookies won't be as attractive. But if you skip on breakfast. Can assure that those cookies, if they are in front of you, will be very difficult to resist. Uh, it's sort of almost beyond human ability to resist them. Uh, but if you have your your porridge or granola in the morning, sort of, ah, you you probably can can wait and maybe even best don't don't buy them in the first place if they're not in <laughs> your house. It's not so easy to eat them. Uh, so, so that, that can also be like, be strategic about how we go about things. But I think for, for sometimes, I know when people, we have holidays, vacations, people come out of them sort of exhausted, tired. Mm. Um, and so they almost need a break the first week after coming back to work, uh, before they're able to do much, uh, that that's quite unfortunate. So that we don't really gain much from that on, on any level. Um, but I think like making this a time because like when we have holidays, there's, we have time to exercise, we have time to sleep, we have time to cook, we have time to socialize, we have time to do all these things that all of us know we don't need convincing that these are good things. Sort of so, well, why don't we do them? Sort of if, if we do them, that would be the most enjoyable holiday we ever could have. Like if you get up in the morning and do the most important things first. Like don't don't plan to exercise eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, if if you can do it eight o'clock in the morning uh, when you have the whole day off, so chances that you will get it done if you do it in the morning is much bigger. Do your Bible study, do your devotionals, do them sort of as first things first. Uh, then it's much better chance that that you will will get get those things done and you're starting a chain reaction of good things. If, if you do it. So uh, that, I think that's, that's my advice. Again, very simple, like focus on good things, do good things, fill your days with good things um, and be intentional about that. Not just switch off your control, your mind and sort of just let whatever happen happens and take the easy way out on everything, uh, but be intentional, still uh, choose what you want to spend your time on also in, in these, these holidays and you will, they will be much better than what they otherwise would have been. As my yes. sister tells her students, make good choices. Yeah. yeah. I, I have an idea, Torben. I'm going to take my three boys during the holiday, mass and all, I'm going to drop them off to you. And then you're going to need one week <laughs> off by the time you come back. I think that would be <laughs> appropriate. Well, by the time they come back, they may have developed such discernment they may not want to come home. <laughs> that that might be true. Might might happen. Yeah. On on Netflix, most people spend most of their time choosing what to watch on Netflix. And two hours yeah. later, they've watched a hundred trailers and then they turn it off and go to bed because there's too much choice. <laughs> so it's it's better to to stay off it as much as possible, I would say. I have a I have a question for both of you. There's been so much made for about 2020 um, that it feels almost like when that calendar rolls over from December to January, it's like everything is going to go away. It kind of nope. feels like this that this is the this is 2020 was the bad year. Let's all pray 2021 is the good year. But we know that that's probably not going to happen. There's not going to be too much of a shift between 
December and January. And so I would like to hear from both of you, Dr. Landless, how should people respond even as vaccines are being administered? How should we still be responding in January, February, and March? Torben, how do we prepare ourselves mentally for this to not just sort of be a reset? Like on January 1st, you're still gonna have to separate from your family. You're still going to not be able to go to work. You're still gonna have to be <clears throat> socially distancing. It's something that I don't know that people are mentally prepared for. I think we really have made too much out of the year and not sort of out of the the, the situation we're in maybe. Um, if both of you could maybe talk to that a little bit. Well, you, you, you very, clearly enunciated this whole issue i think we as human beings love i i used to love getting a new book at school i don't you, you know those of you who went i didn't write on papyrus i wrote on paper and uh, you know we got a clean new book do you remember getting a new a new book that you were going to write in and then as you the first page you could tear out once twice i mean if you wanted to make the book perfect you could tear out many pages until you ended up with a very thin book but it was perfect but we like starting anew we like to turn over a new leaf mm -hmm. we want to start fresh so i think it's a good thing to take stock at the end of the year and to say well what what can i do differently in the time period ahead remembering that when i get out of bed on January 1, after having had a good sleep and I've stayed up all night to watch the ball fall and eaten too much and binged on TV watching, whatever, I haven't done any of those things. And I get out of bed, I look in the mirror, who do I see? For me, said the same person that I saw the night before. So we're not getting away from ourselves, but it doesn't do any harm to think of what can we do into the future? Having said that, the turn of the new year is not going to be a, a sudden change, a miraculous turnaround that suddenly COVID will disappear. We'll be able to get together. We're in this for the long haul. That despite the vaccine, hopefully it will be very effective, very efficacious, very safe in the long term as well. And that it's going to help quell the um, pandemic it's going to be months, in fact, probably into 2022 before we start seeing some kind of normalization if vaccines are available, if people continue to socially distance, if people continue to wash their hands, we will then see changes taking place. So it's not going to be a miraculous change. We are going to have to have our mindset focused on practicing all the good habits, not only of public health issues, but healthful living issues, mentally healthful living issues, so that we can face this new year. So I think we need to, I don't think we should fear. What I love and what keeps me, what gets me out of bed in the morning is the promises that God has given us. He says, be of good courage. Do not be afraid. Time and again in the Bible we read, he says, do not be afraid. Why does he say that? Because he says, I am with you. I'm with you. Claim that promise. Go into the new, new year knowing that God is with us. Regardless of what happens, he has promised. And he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that to me, in my brokenness, in my, in my weakness, in my failing modes, unlike you, I have some of those things. In all of those, he still has said, I will not be. So I'm encouraged, and I want you to be as well. Don't go into this time negatively. Be realistic. We're facing issues. Don't deny the problems we're in, because we're in problematic times. But we have hope. Torben. Yeah, I think sort of if we want things to change uh, going forward, sort of there's no point in wait or there's no reason to wait till January 1st to start implementing those new good uh, lifestyle habits that we want to uh, practice in our lives. Like 
that's just by putting in that off to January 1st. It's just a way to procrastinate for making the changes today that we should should make. So I would say if you sense that, that you need change in life, if I sense I need change in life, well, then I should figure out today how I can start today making those changes. Don't put it off to sometime in the future. That's that's a strategy for failure. Um, but start implementing, get support if you need that from others. People will hold you accountable, people who will support you, people who will do it with you. Um, but I would say that's that's what my recommendation would be like, don't put it off into the future. Life is here and now, and if there's anything that this year has taught us in a way sort of is that like we never know sort of how much time we have in in a way and that's on all levels physically our spiritual health our mental health also let's let's make the changes we want to see happen in our lives start doing them uh, making them today with the help of other people with the help of god um and then i think 2021 can be uh, a better year. I think this year has been a time also for reflection, uh, a time for learning from, for most of us, we've seen things maybe, uh, that we say that this, I need to change in my life. This, I want to be, be different. Um, and then sort of that's, if that's the outcome of it, then something good has come out of it. Also, if, if people can, uh, be more in touch with the life and the way they actually are living uh, and based on that decide to do things differently uh, then 2020 can prove in the long run to have been also a blessing to some uh, in in our lives and that's something i think we're always like all of us as we go through life we're, we're always uh, or we are at various times confronted with things that are challenges, the things that are, that are difficult. Uh, some people have had much more difficult experience in their lives than 2020. Uh, for some of us, maybe 2020 has been one of the most biggest challenges that we've faced. Uh, but for all of us, like uh, focusing on, on the good, uh, turning what is bad, what's been difficult into something good, that something good can come out of it. I think that's something that we always should try to achieve whatever happens yeah that that's excellent and you know both of you have summed up this conversation so perfectly so i don't really want to go too much further in fact dr landless what you and dr Berglund just said i think is perfect way to end the conversation except for would you pray for us and for the people watching sure be a privilege gracious heavenly father Thank you for your love and your kindness, your mercies, your compassions, which fail not. And thank you that even as we've talked about so many issues on this program, we have sensed your presence. We pray that your spirit will take what has been discussed and interpret it everyone who watches and listens to understand what your voice is saying to each of our hearts and we ask that as we come into this time of celebrating the first advent of jesus to this earth we celebrate it in a time which is strange to all of us a time which is different a time which has been very disruptive. But thank you that we have a hope. We have hope that not only did you, did you come the first time, but you have promised that you will come again and that you will make all things new and that the season of problems and troubles which many people have faced not only at this time and not only this year, but through many aspects of their lives, that you will bring an end to all of that. You have promised to go and prepare a home for us and you will take us home to be with you. 
But in the meantime, you have also promised that you will be with us, that you will accompany us, that you will comfort us, that you will bear us up. And so, Father, as we go into this season, we pray that not only will we ask that you bless us, but that you bless everyone. That you also make us a blessing to others. Help us to reach out, help us to be available, help us to be sensitive to the speaking of your word. I pray for every viewer and ask that you will be with them. As varied as our faces are, Father, so are our needs. And my prayer is that your spirit will reach out and they will sense your nearness and know your love. And in our weakness, we come to you just as we are. And we thank you that you are not going to leave us that way. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for that beautiful prayer. And thank you, Dr. Lemlis, and thank you, Torben, for being here with us today on a and in Depth. Um, Ann and in Depth is taking a little vacation. Sam and I are going to go on a little break, but we will both be back with you in the first week of January. We also want to remind you that <clears throat> if you have something you want us to pray for you about, um, we have people who are following this channel and who are dedicated to responding to your comments and to your prayer requests. Mm -hmm. So please let us know if you have a prayer request or if you have any thoughts or questions about these topics. There's somebody who will respond to you and they will pray for you. Um, the information you receive will be in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and have a happy, healthy, safe holiday. God bless.